I talk to a lot of parents about having meetings with the school. And I also am in a lot of schools doing trainings, especially this time of year. And I talk to a lot of the school people about how to have a successful meeting with parents. So I hear it from both sides. And I've got some tips because I will tell you, these meetings can be enormously helpful and also Boy, can they go bad quickly. Welcome to Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about how to manage those tricky emotions that show up in all families. Serious stuff without being too serious. I'm your co-host, Robin, and I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author, and I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a fluster clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. And I'll even tell you what to do and what to say. Lynn, what are we going to talk about today? Robin, here's what we're going to talk about. A lot of parents are going to be having meetings with teachers and school counselors and trying to figure out if you have an anxious kid, how do you come up with a plan? How do you want to talk to your teachers about it? How's everybody going to work together? I'm often on both sides of this. Yeah, you've mentioned this in other episodes and you've hinted that with all the best intentions, it's very easy to feed anxiety and make it worse at this. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like it's really important to get everyone on the same page. Yes. And also it gets really adversarial really quickly. Like I see that a lot for a few reasons. One is that A lot of times people don't really understand anxiety. I don't say that with blame. It's just a fact. Parents want the best for their children. If you have an anxious child, chances are you might be kind of a worrier yourself. So you are going to the school and you are feeling very vulnerable. You are feeling very exhausted a lot of the times. You're feeling like you're trying to do the best for your child, but you're so worried about your child being okay in school. So you go in with really high expectations, and sometimes we go in with a little bit of mama bear energy. So that sort of sets things up. And then on the other side of it, with the best of intentions, schools can put things in place that actually are not helpful and actually make it harder on parents. And right away, everybody is working toward a different goal. I also think that in some of these meetings, there's a lot on the table. So sometimes you go into a meeting in which you're looking at an IEP, which is an individualized education plan. There are a lot of experts in the room. There are a lot of voices in the room. You have to sign off on things. It feels like a really high pressure situation. And I think that what I want to talk about today is How do we make these meetings successful? Because ultimately, everybody has the same goal, and it just gets distorted and gets convoluted very quickly. Great. And you probably have advice for the elementary school-aged kids, and I have a feeling we should probably also talk about the teens after, right? Yeah. Let me start with the younger kids, and then we'll talk sort of when kids get older, because that has a similar but different requirements and similar but different demands. So let's talk about little kids that are anxious. And so maybe you've got a little child who's starting school for the first time. Maybe you have a child who is a second or third grader and you know historically that they've had a rough time being in school. Maybe there are certain things that you're learning about your child that you really want the school to know about. It could be significant things like you know your child has some obsessive compulsive issues that are coming out. Maybe there's separation stuff going on. Maybe there's social anxiety. So you've got this little kid who's shy, who's really having a difficult time making friends. So let's talk about how to make those meetings with the school positive. The first thing you want to do is you just want to start with the teacher. You want to start with communicating with the teacher and saying, here are some important things I want you to know about my child. Here are some of the things that we're struggling with. And before you talk to the teacher, parents, I want you to come up in your head, not just in your head, write it down on a piece of paper. What is your goal for this school year? 
Because when you go into a meeting with a teacher or with the school counselor or the school psychologist, whoever it is that they are to support you, the question that I ask at the beginning of all these meetings is if we had a successful second grade year or if we had a successful kindergarten year, whatever, what would that look like at the end of the year? What would that look like at the end of the school year if this year was successful for your child? And I want you and teachers, if you're listening, and clinicians, I mean, this is just a really good question to ask. This is often the question I ask at the beginning of a therapy session when I'm first meeting a family. If this therapy were to be successful, what would that look like? And write that down. And when I'm talking to schools, when I'm talking to teachers, I advise that they write that down because then that's something that we're going to go back and refer to over and over and over again. Are we doing the things we need to do in order to meet this goal? And the goal might be, I want her to be able to have some friends. I want her to be able to speak to other kids in class. I want her to leave school with a little spring in her step, or I want drop off to be easier, or I want her to be able to eat in the cafeteria. I want her to get through a day without crying. I want her to be able to go to the bathroom by herself. Just write that down and be clear about that. And then we're going to work back from there. Yeah, it's interesting. Everything you just listed as examples, when you focus on those outcomes, it would be a good idea for the parents to recognize here is the emotional skill that needs strengthening. Mm -hmm. And then also the parents can ask themselves how they're trying to nurture that skill at home too. That's right. So then you, you both have this idea. And maybe there are a few goals. You pick two or three of those. Then the question is, how are we going to help build that skill? And it might be an emotional skill. It might be a social skill. It might be a behavioral skill. It might be a figuring out how to handle things in a classroom skill because there are little kids that haven't learned that yet. And then the teachers, the school staff, and the parents come together and say, how can we help build this? And then you begin to talk very concretely about what you're going to do at home and what the school is going to do at school. And then how are the school people and the family people going to communicate that? Keep it simple. Oftentimes when I look at a IEP plan or I look at an accommodation plan, which we'll talk about in a moment, I see things that are too vague for my liking. So as you're coming up with this list of what you want your child to accomplish, stay away from that vague language of, I want her to be happy at school. Too vague. Too vague. And be yesy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, too vague. Too, yeah, as I always say, all the time. Well, and think about that. If your goal as a parent, if you worry about your child and your goal as a parent is that in second grade, I want her to be happy at school, and then she comes home because she had a sad day or a bad day, and then you get on the phone right away, like, what happened? You know, our goal was for her to be happy, and she came home and she was sad. It just doesn't work, right? Right. Maybe a goal is I want her to be able to put words to her feelings when she comes home from school. I want her to be able to handle making a mistake at school without falling apart. Be as specific as you can. And then you're going to talk to the school about that and you're going to ask those how questions. How can we teach her this skill? And how will we know if we're making progress? We don't have to have a lot of data collection. We don't have to have things on a spreadsheet, but you want to just have a conversation between the parents and the school people that says, this is what we're working on. Now, you may have to brainstorm a little bit about how you're going to develop that skill. So maybe you will say, well, we really want her to be able to make some friends this year. That's a goal. We really want her to have friends. So you say to the teacher, how can we communicate together to make sure that we're working toward that? And the teacher might say, well, why don't I just pay attention to what other little students are in the class that I think might be a good fit, and I'll see if I can help model for them playing together or doing things together, and I will let you know if there's another child that I think that they're connecting with, 
I'll let you know so that maybe you and that child's parents can foster some play dates or get together. So there's a lot of communication about how are we going to coach these little kids to connect? How are we going to coach them to connect? Talk specifics and talk skills. Say one of the goals is I want my child to be able to get into school in the morning without the horrible separation that's happening. We've got crying going on in the car. She's refusing to get on the bus. She says her tummy hurts. So you're going to have a conversation with the school about the skill that you need to learn in order to separate from your mommy or daddy. And that goes back to all of the things that we talked about. If you haven't listened to the Anxiety Disruptor series we did this summer, go back and review that. Make sure you and the school are using that same language. We're going to externalize the worry. We're going to give it a name. We're going to be very consistent in people using the same language. We should take a break. But when we come back, I want to ask you about school nurses. Oh, please do. Okay, what parents need that extra boost in the back-to-school season? Lynn, I know you love Metabolic Reds by Pure Health Research. I really do. I really love them. Metabolic Reds is a delicious superfood blend that contains wonderful adaptogens like ashwagandha. Adaptogens? Robin, adaptogens are known as nature's stress busters because of their remarkably calming effect. Plus, probiotics, digestive enzymes that help ignite your metabolism. And did I mention that metabolic reds taste delicious like a delicious berry smoothie? As a listener of our show, you can try metabolic reds risk-free today and get a free bottle of metabolic greens with your first order. Just go to getreds.com slash fluster to learn more. That's getreds.com slash fluster to purchase metabolic reds and claim your free gift. Okay, what parents need that extra boost in the back to school season? Lynn, I know you love Metabolic Reds by Pure Health Research. I really do. I really love them. Metabolic Reds is a delicious superfood blend that contains wonderful adaptogens like ashwagandha. Adaptogens? Robin, adaptogens are known as nature's stress busters because of their remarkably calming effect. Plus, probiotics, digestive enzymes that help ignite your metabolism, and did I mention that metabolic reds taste delicious like a delicious berry smoothie. As a listener of our show, you can try Metabolic Reds risk-free today and get a free bottle of Metabolic Greens with your first order. Just go to getreds.com slash fluster to learn more. That's getreds.com slash fluster to purchase Metabolic Reds and claim your free gift. Okay, we're back. So Lynn, you always say that school nurses are your some of your biggest heroes, especially on the front line of really helping a child manage this. Mm -hmm. I imagine getting a school nurse involved and on the same page for those physical symptoms of anxiety is key. Tell us about that. Yeah. So I love you school nurses if you're listening. What's interesting to me about that, I'm so glad you asked me about that, Robin, is because very often when I ask about school meetings, and very often when I'm asked to come into school meetings, because I will do that for my clients, I'll be at that school meeting, whether they, <laughs> they usually know I'm coming, is that the school nurses aren't there, which is always surprising to me. And when I'm training a bunch of school nurses, I'll say, how many of you are routinely invited to meetings about this anxious student? And very few generally raise their hands. So I want the school nurses to be in the loop because Say one of the goals is I want the child to be able to reduce visits to the school nurse. That's a really good goal. Or I want the child, when they go to the school nurse, here's a goal that you can have. When they go to the school nurse, I want them to have the language to walk in and say, I'm here to see you because my worry is making my tummy hurt. That's a skill that we can teach kids because then they are connecting and articulating what's going on inside of them. Instead of saying, I have to go to the school nurse because I'm sick. Right. So if a school nurse knows, and generally they know, they figure out pretty quickly who the frequent flyers are. Because I always say the school nurse is such a wonderful resource to have for all sorts of things, but really for anxiety and for worry, you show up at the school nurse and we teach kids that language to say, 
I'm here because my worry is making me feel badly, or I'm here because my worry is making my tummy hurt. And then the nurse says, oh, let's talk about how we're going to manage your worry. Can you imagine how many adults need that (laughs) skill too? Yeah. Yeah. And how, what a gift to give your anxious child that self-awareness early on. Oh, yeah. These little kids that are very somatic, as we say, and remember the I'm sure I've said this before, but the younger you are and the more anxious your parents are, the more likely it is that you're going to be somatic, meaning that you talk about your anxiety in terms of physical symptoms. Those little somatic kids grow up to be big somatic kids, grow up to be somatic adults. I see them all the time. So imagine a meeting with your school, with your teacher, with the school nurse, with the school counselor, whoever is there. And you all decide that you're going to use the same language to talk about worry when it shows up. Everybody knows that the worry is named Phyllis. Everybody knows that the worry shows up on Monday mornings or Sunday nights. Everybody knows that they can be supportive and loving and caring of this little child while not doing the disorder. That brings me to a very important point. When you go into a school meeting, and you are working with the school to deal with your child's anxiety, be very aware of who is advising you. Because the people I talk to in schools are, shall I say this, fed up with somebody who doesn't know how to deal with anxiety, writing a letter or coming to a school meeting and doing the exact opposite of what they have heard me talk about because I did a training with the school. So the way it plays out is I'll do a training at a school and they're really working to help manage the anxiety. We're really working on getting rid of those elimination strategies. We're really working on building skills. And then there's a family and they will have perhaps an advocate, which can be a great thing to help you navigate all the special education stuff in schools because it's very confusing and complicated. And I'm not an expert in that at all, but they might have an advocate. They might have an attorney. They might have a physician, and oftentimes the people either writing the letter or coming to the meeting to support the parents are not experts in anxiety. By the term expert, I mean they don't know how to treat anxiety, and they will support and they will advocate for, and they will be rather confrontational, getting the school to accommodate to avoid, to support the disorder, not on purpose. They're not doing it on purpose, but they just don't know what they're talking about. So doing the disorder means that you're giving the anxiety exactly what it wants, which is to avoid, to eliminate, to not feel this way. Just to be clear, I do not want schools or parents, if they've been accommodating Or if this child is really having difficulty being in school, I do not want you to go in and just rip the rug out from under all these kids and say, well, nope, sorry, now you got to deal with it. Because sometimes people misunderstand me and they're like, yep, we've been accommodating these kids too long and we need to just throw them in there and they'll learn how to deal with it. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you go in to a meeting and you say, the goal is for my child to never feel anxious or the goal is for my child not to be frightened by a fire alarm or my goal is for my child not to feel fill in the blank, you're doing the disorder. The goal is to help your child tolerate those things, even if they feel overwhelming at times, even if they feel uncomfortable. And how are you going to work with the school to step-by-step teach your child how to manage, for example, a fire alarm, or how to manage a noisy cafeteria, or how to manage when they make a mistake, or how to manage being able to participate in music class. What you want to talk about is not these blanket accommodations that say, we will remove this child forevermore, but to say, what can we do, starting where the child is right now, what can we do to talk about the worry, right? We're going to externalize it. We're going to give it a name. And so that we're all working toward the goal of being able to tolerate uncertainty, being able to tolerate not knowing. I love the example of fire alarms, but I think I've used that a lot before. So let me just pick another one for the sake of variety. And let me talk about maybe a difficult drop-off. 
what somebody might say is, this child has a really difficult time being dropped off. And so we are going to put an accommodation in place where mom can bring or dad can bring in the child 15 minutes early or 15 minutes late. We're going to allow mom to come into the classroom or we're going to make sure that there's a teacher there that greets her and walks her to the classroom. All of that stuff sounds good as a place to start, kind of, but what we really want to be focusing on is how are we going to teach this little child the skill of being able to say goodbye to whoever is dropping her off and make that transition into the classroom. If you go at it by saying, this child should not feel uncomfortable, this child should not get upset, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that she's not upset, that's going to backfire. What we might say in this school meeting or the goal we might have is, we're all going to use this same language. So at drop-off time, we're going to start with the teacher coming or the counselor coming There's going to be a quick goodbye from the parent, and we are going to talk about how worry shows up and what does worry say and how can we manage it. And maybe that conversation is going to be happening while you're walking to the classroom. And then at the end of the school day, mom or dad might say, is there anything you want to tell me about drop-off? Did you have any successes at drop-off? Not sort of like, tell me what happened, but did you have any successes at drop-off? And see if you can just continue this consistent conversation between the school and between the parent so that everybody's using the same language. I see lots of things that say the child should be able to contact the parent during the day. The child should be able to stay with the parent during the day. I've had professionals in a variety of roles say it's important that the mom sits in her car in the parking lot all day. So if the child feels uncomfortable, she can look out the window or go to her mom. I'm serious. I've had several professionals advise that as an intervention. That's doing this disorder big time. So what you want to talk to the school about in your meeting is how can we use this consistent language that talks about being okay with feeling uncomfortable, being able to manage the worry, and everybody being able to tolerate some distress as you're teaching these skills. And when you communicate with the school like that, rather than having somebody come in and write a letter or make a pronouncement or be adversarial as if the school is the enemy and the school does the same thing to parents, I've seen it plenty of times, that we're all on the same page, we all have the same goal, what are the skills we're working on? If you keep that question at the forefront of your mind, then you're all going to be talking the same language to the child. And that's enormously helpful. And you do it with love and support and encouragement. And parents need a ton of encouragement in this. Teachers have the student's best interest at heart, and they're really working. Everybody's working toward the same goal. It's very different when that happens than when it gets adversarial. But say one of our listeners, Mm -hmm. say that family has read your book, listened to the podcast, saw you speak, and they really get that they're trying to increase the skill of tolerating discomfort. Mm -hmm. The parents are working on allowing themselves to tolerate seeing their kids in distress. They're on board. They know what the end game is. Mm -hmm. But the school who might not have the same insight is just trying to make everybody happy to move on. They'll say we don't have the capability of personalizing or being patient for or whatever. What happens there? I'm sure you've seen that. Yes, a lot, actually. And I've also seen, so let's remember that we have anxious parents, but we also have anxious teachers, right? So the teachers are really feeling anxious about doing harm. So they're worried that, oh my gosh, if I allow this child to feel distress, I'm somehow hurting them emotionally. I'm not being supportive. So teachers have a lot of worry and concern about doing the wrong thing. So I absolutely see that. So I think the parent in that situation can say to the teacher, can say to the school counselor, this is the plan that we're working on. And let me just give you a script. Let me just give you the language that we use. And also, just so you know, When we talk to little Amanda about her worry part, which we have named Joseph, 
Amanda very often gets pissed at us and tells us that it's not Joseph, but we stick with it. So as much as the parents can sort of coach the school and to say, look, this is not complicated, but it can be hard work. We need to be consistent, but we really want you to use this language. Generally, most of the time, the school is like, oh, great. Thank you for telling us. I have had situations. It doesn't happen that often, but I have had situations where a teacher who is not really informed, and this generally actually happens with OCD more than anything else, the teacher will insist that that's not the problem. The teacher will insist that the child's being stubborn. The teacher will insist that a child who's having a great difficulty with anxiety or OCD actually has an attention problem. The teacher will insist that it's a naughty behavior. That's really hard for me to deal with because, again, the teacher is not conversant and won't go along with the plan. I've had that happen mm, probably more times than I'd like. It's not the rule. It's the exception, not the rule. At the beginning of the school year, for my kids that are anxious, I very frequently meet with their team. Sometimes I go in in person. Sometimes I do it on a Zoom call. And for the most part, the team at school is really, really grateful for information, concrete information. This is the language that we're using. The other thing I'll say about this, Robin, is that when schools say to me, we don't have the time or the resources or the wherewithal to do what you're asking, Lynn, or to do what you're asking parents, what I will say to them is, I know for a fact that when you do the disorder and the disorder gets worse, you are spending an enormous amount of time in mop-up mode. So I am trying to have you be proactive rather than reactive. But I know that for kids that are not going to school, for kids that are not able to stay in the classroom, for kids that are really struggling with their social issues, those kids will end up eating up a lot of your time and resources. So don't tell me you can't do this now because I know you're going to have to do it later. So I really try and say, like, let's put in the work, let's front load this because it's going to be preventative. And that usually is enough to get people's attention. So now let's go the other side. I know we have a ton of teachers Mm -hmm. who listen to the podcast. Mm -hmm. So they're like, oh, okay, I have this anxious kid. The parent comes in and wants to just do the disorder. (laughs) Yes. I know there are like dozens of teachers listening right now who are like, yes. (laughs) Yeah. Give the teachers what to say. And what to do. No, and you're exactly right. Because when I'm doing school trainings, when I'm doing teacher trainings, that's probably the most frequent question that I get asked is that a teacher will raise their hand or a school counselor will raise their hand and say, okay, so I agree with everything that you're saying and I feel like I can do this. The parent is not on board. Point number one, if a parent completely refuses to do any of these things that we're talking about, that's not on you, teacher, because If I'm doing therapy with a family and the parent is like, nope, we're not doing any of that, I (laughs) I don't get very far either. So know that you're not going to bat a thousand and there are some situations in which the parent is going to just refuse. And if a parent comes into a meeting or into a conversation with a lawyer or with an advocate or a doctor's note, oftentimes the school feels like they're pretty handcuffed with that. So knowing that, and that's okay, and I get it, and sometimes you're just going to have to be like, all right, there's not much we can do. But if you can establish a relationship with a parent, and if you can say very early on, I know from hearing from the teacher last year, or I know from other meetings that you've been involved in, I know that your child is really struggling with some anxiety issues. I'd love to have a conversation with you about how we can teach your child the skills that they need in order to move forward. Would you be open to having a conversation about that? Anxiety is really powerful when we let it run the show. And I certainly don't want to see your child struggling so much. And then you ask that same question, what is your goal? If this were to be a really good year for your child, what would be the things you would want to see and how can I help you get there? And you might say, one of the things that I've been learning about is that if we just accommodate the anxiety in the absence of skill building, 
this problem is going to get worse. And I fear that by making the anxiety the boss right now, that we're just going to continue to sort of see this worsen over time. The teacher says, if you're willing to research and learn more about this evidence-based approach, I want you to know that I'm committed Mm -hmm. to supporting your child and your family and helping manage anxiety. Oh, I love that. That's so much better than what I said. I mean, no, (laughs) that's true. I mean, that's very well said. It's a partnership. Being able to say to a parent who's struggling with anxiety, these are some resources that I found, and these are the things that I'd love to talk to you about. This is a way to approach this that I think is really helpful. And there are some school districts that I work with, and they really are taking this approach in a broad way. And so this language is being taught to parents. You are going to come up against parents that are going to say, and I'm sure none of those parents are listening now, but you're going to come up against parents that are going to say, no, you're not going to do that. It's not your place. I'm going to do what I want to do. You know, sometimes you just have to cut your losses and recognize that. But I love that statement of this is a partnership. Here's some interesting information, and I am fully committed. I said at the beginning that these meetings get very adversarial very quickly. And it is mainly because people just don't have adequate or evidence-based or appropriate information about how anxiety works. In all sorts of settings, people do the disorder, not because they're trying to make the anxiety worse, but because they're doing what works in the short term or what feels loving or caring or intuitive. Really, the idea that this is a partnership where all groups are going to be informed about how this thing works, I'll tell you, I've seen amazing things happen in classrooms with teachers and parents that are working together. It really is fabulous. I will go into a school meeting next week and I will meet with the team, with the parents, and I already know that we are going to make progress this year because of the communication that I've gotten from the school, right? It just works. Well, after we take a break, I want to hear some specific tips for the high school population. Robin, fall is finally here, and that means back to routine, back to our busy schedules, and the best argument for the best time-saving hack for weeknight dinners, every plate. If you think meal kits are too expensive, think again, because every plate is 25% cheaper than grocery shopping. Don't turn to takeout when things get hectic. Instead, get every plate delivery. It's 58% cheaper than your average fast casual meal, and you can always feel good about what you're eating. I know you're saying this to me because of our takeout habit, and it's time to be better prepared this fall. You have a takeout habit? Hmm. Well, Every plate's quality ingredients come pre-proportioned to help you save money and reduce food waste. You know, like that bag of spinach you throw out every week? You can skip your weekly trip to the grocery store, too. You know I love that. Every plate delivers simple, stress-free recipes that come together in just six steps and are ready in around 30 minutes or less. And they're so easy, I ask my kids to prepare them. Not only is every plate a great way to eat affordably, it tastes great too. With recipes like super smashed burgers, ponzu chili steak bowls, creamy lemon herb chicken, we've had some delicious pork recipes that have been so good, you can find new favorites to make in your regular dinner rotation. At first I was skeptical thinking meal kits might be expensive, but now I'm convinced you can get the same deliciousness at a much lower price. And also, I love how every plate was enough food for my family. Other meal plans that we've tried in the past, they were like appetizers for my boys. Get your first box for $1.49 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering the code FLUSTER149. Yep, so just get started with every plate for just $1.49 per meal on your first box by going to everyplate.com and entering the code FLUSTER149. That's up to a $110 value. Lynn, I love that I almost never have to go to the grocery store anymore. Yeah, you know that I like to avoid the grocery store when I can. Finding all your grocery items in one place at an affordable price is almost impossible now. But with Thrive Market, 
I get everything I need and so much more. With Thrive Market, I can shop for everything from healthy pantry essentials and sustainable meat and seafood to non-toxic cleaning and beauty products, all delivered right to my door. And if you find a price lower elsewhere, Thrive Market will match it. They have over 5,000, 5,000 food, home, beauty products. Finding what you need is easy with Thrive Market. So if you're looking for plant-based, keto, gluten-free, zero waste, BIPOC-owned brands, Thrive Market has you covered with favorites like 7th Generation Cleaning Supplies and Bob's Red Mill Gluten-Free Flowers. When you join Thrive Market, you're joining a community of 1 million members and sponsoring a family in need. So join Thrive Market today and get $80 in free groceries. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash flusterclucks to get $80 in free groceries. What a deal. That's thrivemarket.com slash flusterclucks. Thrivemarket.com slash flusterclucks. Okay, let's get back to this conversation. All right, so let's talk about high school, which is a little trickier because they're bigger. And as my husband will often point out to me, the pathways are more fully formed. So if you have a child or if you have a student who is in high school, it is likely if they're really having difficulty in high school, it's likely that these patterns have been in place for a while, not all the time. Same rules apply earlier, the better, but it's never too late. You really want to make sure that when you're talking to the school parents with a high school student, that you are making sure that you are not stepping in to put all sorts of accommodations in place because you're really worried about academics or you're really worried about a resume, you're really worried about a transcript. One of the things that I am seeing now, because as we are recording this in the second week of September, is that a lot of kids who were anxious and had a lot of accommodations going through high school in the absence of skill building, and remember, I'm talking about accommodations as they pertain to anxiety, I'm seeing a lot of these kids going off to college and not doing so great. So if you have a high schooler, ninth grader, 10th grader, even if you have a junior, do not hesitate to have a meeting with the school and to open the meeting by saying, I really want my child to be able to move forward after high school. We've got some skill building to do. And I want to make sure that what I'm doing and what we're doing as a partnership here isn't making the problem worse. This is a time where if you are a parent and you're anxious, you have to make sure that you are not doing the disorder by paving the path for your anxious child and forgetting that they need these skills in order to survive at the next step. I think the other thing that's really important when we're talking about anxiety in high school students is that there needs to be a focus on their social connection. And so if you are concerned about your child, if the anxiety is keeping them from participating in things, that's one of the pathways into depression. I would have a meeting with the school and I would say, one of the things I really want to focus on is how can we connect my child to other kids, to activities, to volunteer work, right? Really focus on volunteer work. How can I help support the school and how can the school help support our family in building some connection? Because as they work on their anxiety, maybe they're in therapy, maybe they're trying to figure this out. The school can be a really helpful source of social connection if you can all talk about this together. The other thing to remember is that it is absolutely okay and even beneficial to include your high school student in these meetings and in these conversations. So now when we're asking that question about if I have a good sophomore year, they are the ones that are actually helping to talk about what their goal is and everybody better listen. Really pay attention. Don't let your expectations and your goals override what your anxious kid is telling you. 
If you've got an anxious child that says, I really want to make friends, put that at the top of the list. And the school can be helpful in that if you all work in, in partnership. You know, this is a perfect segue because we got a listener question about from a parent and she's a, a mom with her child going to a new school and she admits she has social anxiety and she needs to make some friends. So she was asking for some tips from you. Oh, okay. That's such a good question. I know. Oh, so we spend so much time thinking about how are we going to help our kids make friends at a new school? And we sometimes forget like the moms and the dads are having some difficult too. I think there's also a lot of pressure because this mom, I would bet, knows that part of her helping her child sort of integrate into this new school means that she also has to make connections with the adults. It's the stuff that I talk about all the time with people who are shy or introverted is that small things matter. So when you are socially anxious, you do a lot of comparing and you compare yourself to the very extroverted person. You compare yourself to the person who can walk up to a rock and have a conversation. You compare yourself to the person who looks like they've got everything together and they arrive in the morning to drop off their kids and their clothes look great and the lunchbox looks great and you, you feel like you're a hot mess and everybody's judging you. Isn't it funny how the moms who show up who don't work outside the home, the yoga pant, the unbrushed teeth mm -hmm. that drop off, they're looking at the women on the way to work where they're feeling frumpy. The women on the way to work are looking at the moms who are staying at home with their kids and like, <laughs> I'm off to work. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's just like we all do that. And it's just important to know that like everyone does yeah, it. Yeah, everybody does it, right? So you're like, oh, if only I could be wearing yoga pants and somebody else is like, oh, if her hair looks so good. Yeah, we all do it because we're all in different situations. Social comparison is something that human beings do because we're social creatures. Here's my tip to this shy mom. Give yourself a goal of just making eye contact, smiling, and saying hi to people. Just say, I'm going to go to drop off, or I'm going to go to this open house at school. I'm going to go to the playground to pick up my child, and I'm going to work very hard on putting on a friendly face. Now, for those of us who are extroverted, we think, well, that doesn't sound hot at all. Just go and have, put on a friendly face. But if you're shy, that's what happens is that you are internally focused. Remember, when you're socially anxious, you are inside of you having a conversation with you about you. So first goal is just go and say, I'm just going to put on a friendly face, even if you have to fake it. Then look for opportunities in which you can be involved in the school and be given a job to do. Because right. when you are socially anxious and you have to sort of figure it out on your own, that feels hard. But join something where they say, well, we need somebody to organize this or we need somebody to blah, 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 and have a job, have a role so that when you step into that situation with your social anxiety, you know what you're going to do. And that helps a lot. Third thing, people are going to judge you. Socially anxious people don't like that but they do, you have to tolerate knowing that people are going to have thoughts about you. People are going to have opinions about you, just like you are going to have thoughts and opinions about other people. That's just the way human beings work. The problem with socially anxious people is that they assume that everybody is judging them harshly. They assume that people are thinking bad things about them. They assume that they're not getting it done. Planet Fitness says this is a judgment-free zone. Whenever I hear that out, I'm like, no, it's not. This is a judgment-filled zone, right? We have to get away from this idea that judgment, we have to get rid of it, and it's so horrible, and how can you tolerate it? You're going to walk in, and you're going to tolerate judgment. Some of it may be positive, by the way. So those are the three things I would suggest to this mom. Go in on purpose with a friendly face. Say hi to as many people. Smile, make eye contact. Sign up for something where you have a role, a job, where something is conscripted to you and go in saying, I am going to tolerate judgment. I'm going to allow this to be a judgment fill zone. As crazy as that sounds, it takes the pressure off and it's actually more realistic than thinking you have to go in and not be judged. That doesn't work. I'd love to add a couple of things I feel like I have learned as a mom, and now I'm done with the elementary school chapter. Okay. 
here's a weird truth. I think that all the moms are hanging out and going and doing things that you're not invited to. Everyone has this assumption that there's like all of these things going on that you're not a part of. That is something every mom feels. Yep. So that's like a universal thing. So if you have that feeling and it's holding you back, everyone has that feeling. Second thing is, I think, especially if it's hard to make friends and you are shy, it can feel like a lot of pressure because you think like, I got to do this because I got to help my kids have friends and socialize. Mm -hmm. Until you find a couple of kids at school where that happens, any socializing with other kids of people you already know matters. Mm -hmm. That's right. And just the kids are still getting experience playing with other kids. So maybe it's cousins. Maybe it's someone that you, you know, you knew from college or whatever. Like any of those types of friends still give your kids some social skills that they need. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is, here's some good news. When your kids get older, the kids dictate their social lives. And all of this stuff kind of goes away. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. And so that's what, like, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. And the other thing, too, I think just to sort of add on to that is that we put a lot of pressure on ourselves as moms that our kids' schedules are supposed to be full all the time. And so if we're working or we're more introverted or we don't have any new mom friends to hang out with, we feel like our kids have to be busy all the time and have to be scheduled all the time. That is so far from the truth. It is really okay for you and for your child to have free time in which you're not scheduled. That's not a way to measure your success as the mom of a young child is how busy your kid is. It's really okay for them to play with Legos. So you know how like family members have different nicknames and stuff. I just want to tell you, this is the best nickname ever. And I actually have permission from my friend to tell this, but she said, I have to use a different first name. So I'll call her Sally. So Sally's my really good friend. She's super funny. And she has a little niece who's two. And the niece has named the grandfather Tall Baby. <laughs> I just I, I just picturing like a bald head and a big belly. <laughs> no, that's the best part. It's not about his physique. It's about the way he moves through the world. And according to my friend, Sally, it is the most appropriate name that you could give this guy. So they all call him Tall Baby now, like to his face. (laughs) I was out on a bike ride with her and the phone rang and she goes, oh, it's Tall Baby. I'll have to call him back later. That's what she calls her dad now. They all call him Tall Baby. And they're like, oh my God, it's perfect. And it took the two-year-old to come up with this name. It's just the best name ever. Yeah. So don't be a tall baby, everyone. It will catch up to you. It will catch up to you. Yeah. If this episode was helpful to you, you can join our Facebook community and we'd love it if you left a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Fluster Clucks. Bye, Robin. Bye, Lynn.